Thank you. I, I, I told my colleague here that we should talk first. He said, you talk first. I said, let's toss a coin. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm stuck. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to have this very, very eminent group with us. And we have some time to discuss several issues. And I think if we, if we look back at the kind of a broad theme that was uh, in a way interwoven into these different presentations, <coughs> I would like to uh, think of two or three ideas as being important for this discussion. One, of course, is the purpose of the higher education, that is employability. Are we looking at higher education purely as a source of providing livelihoods at a higher level, at contributing to economic development through the schools that are imparted at the university? Are we looking at a grander vision of the development of a state and the country through the provision of this higher education, in which case we have a large vision in mind about the kind of economy or the kind of development economy that we want to have for our country. And I, I would like to flag this. Given the different experiences of these three countries, I'd like to flag this issue of employability and its linkage to education. And in a way, linked to this employability is of course a question of employability where is it going to be constrained to opportunities of employability in your own country, in which case you are educating people for the kind of economy that you would want to have in your own country? But are you also wanting to educate people for global employment, in which case the kind of people that you want to develop should fit into a global environment as it developed over the next 10 to 20 years? And in which case, the kind of education, higher education universities must provide, must be much more outward looking rather than inward looking when you're looking at the economy. So this is the second thought that I would like to place. And the third and final thought is, is this not too narrow just to look at universities as employability <coughs> machines to provide people, to educate people to go to out and do work whether in the country or outside, where does the role of innovation and addition to knowledge and incremental, I would say, uh, improvement to, to knowledge and therefore to human that come from? And if, if I could, if I could put these three as as kind of a broad opening thoughts for discussion, and what perhaps we could do is to to listen to our panelists on, on their views on these two or three topics and then open it up to the, to the rest of these things for asking questions. And I want it to be very interactive. So I want, uh, when you <coughs> think, if I'm talking through my hat or if I'm talking rubbish, I want you to get up and tell me you're talking rubbish. Huh? And there's something else that you need to talk about. Please do that. And that will make it much more friendly and much more interesting. So can I now just leave it to the lady first? That's a new interpretation to ladies first. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I, I think that um, your first and your third um, uh, comment slash question might well be taken together. Um, one is really this question of education, higher education for, for the workforce, um, so getting students and graduates ready uh, employable and work ready. And the other is about the university as institution and the faculty and researchers of the, of the institution of higher education as a way of helping to propel um, economic development and uh, uh, national need through the innovative work that comes from research. So it's really about the twin pillars of education and research at the university um, uh, that are the roles of a university. 
Um, I am a firm believer in both those two roles because I think that if faculty members are interested only in research, then they belong in a research institute. If you're in a university, it is both about education and about research. Education for the students to prepare them for the workplace, but also for life more generally, I think. Um, so that it is not just about do you have practical skills that you can take into the workplace, but about um, the sense of being a, 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 an individual within a community and a society, a sense of responsibility and ethics that comes along with that. Um, so education and research. If you look at the um, research universities in the US, for example, um, you know, if you look at Stanford and its role in Silicon Valley, that's a very good example of how the university is part of the, the engine for growth, in a sense, through the innovation and research that comes out of the university. And you see that as a strategy that various sorts of uh, economies are trying to adopt, ensuring that the work of the university is linked back uh, to economic growth and development. Um, the second question about globalization, are we, are we preparing students for, for the world at our doorsteps or is the world really the oyster, uh, I, I, you know, the larger world out there? Um, I think that the difference is one of degree, not kind. So depending on the economy that one is in, depending on the kind of society that one is in, um, there will be different degrees to which students need to be more prepared globally. Um, so a, a place like Singapore, for example, which is tiny, right? So you know the joke about how if you drive in fourth gear, you might find yourself in Malaysia, or if you know there is no such thing except for an international flight here. It's such a small country that a lot of what we do, everything that we do, has a global dimension. So it it it, it is. Um, almost a given that I think we need to help our students prepare for the global world. In other places which are far larger, far more uh, able to rely on themselves in a sense, even they, I think, need to be preparing the students for the global world, but perhaps the, the sense of anxiety, the sense of urgency, the sense of immediate need may be less, um, less strong, perhaps. Uh, and even so, I, I think it's really a question of a slight uh, difference in terms of degree rather than a difference in kind as such. Um, so if I might just pause there. Let, let, let me just uh, try to push these boundaries a bit. I think, uh, uh, okay, the simple vision is employability in terms of provide values and standards to provide employability which would be globally acceptable. But I think if you look at the kind of example that we saw from China, from China, there the focus is on providing the kind of skills and capabilities which are focused on the, on the internal economy. High level of technological capability, manufacturing, enormous uh, 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 competence in, in, in production of goods and services. And if you look at the other side, the, the IIT, it's a totally different focus altogether. It much more towards, uh, I would say, skills which are which are useful in the service sector rather than the manufacturing sector. So we have a three totally different stories here, and I think we need to discuss whether all are relevant, some are relevant, or some are relevant only in some circumstances. Uh, I think it just I mentioned uh, this morning uh, what's the purpose of the higher education uh, not only should be thinking by university itself uh, also should be thinking by uh, society by government uh, especially for developing country like China and the India and uh, the government pushed the university uh, as a government demand oriented. Uh, that's a, it's also the reason. So uh, 
that things needed to be solved by university. I think the first thing we need to think about is the priority about, of the university uh, in education. But here I would like to, 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 to see research is a part of the education for higher education especially because uh, the science develop, develop very fast. If you want to teach the students the new technology or new science, you have to do research. So from that way, I think that the, the government, the uh, university needs to think about the priority. And the government should be thinking about what kind of function of a uh, university for its uh, social economy uh, construction. Uh, that means uh, whether you need a university to do currently leads of the society, whether you need a uh, university to do the tomorrow's needs or uh, after tomorrow. We think that the, the uh, Thailand contribution were towards for after tomorrow, not current. So that's a question for me. So, so you know, thinking about these questions, uh, you know, I think the answer would be very different depending on what kind of university we're talking about. And uh, really, uh, question of employability, I mean that word was really coined by the IT industry in India, the information technology industry, which has been hiring you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, young students straight after they finished their college degree. And what they found was that many of the engineers, so their strategy was to hire any engineer, that even if you did metallurgical engineering, you could still go and work in a software company. And what they found was the skill set was not right for doing the software work or whatever projects that they were given. And hence, many of these companies actually set up massive uh, and have set up very great training centers for bridging the skill set. So, at the lowest level, if you look at employability in that sense, uh, this solution seems really ideal. That the university gives a sort of basic education. But if it's something very specialized, let's say IT de you know, software development or IT services, let the industry take care of the rest of the expenses. However, you know, nobody from a place like IT would now go and join an IT company for this kind of a job. Uh, when you have such talented people coming into a university, I feel that the focus must be the student. And at IIT Bombay, our sort of philosophy in recent years has been that can we give much more you know, choice to the students to try and grow and develop while they are in the institute, to allow them to try and figure out you know, what are they good at, what do they like. And hence, you know, the, what we've tried to do is we've significantly reduced the core of what the students are supposed to do even in an engineering course. And a vast choice is given. You know, they can, besides doing these core courses, they can take courses in many other different fields. So I feel it is difficult for today a professor to tell a student that if we study all these courses and they will be okay for you for the next 20, 30 years that you're going to be working. Because things are changing so fast, it is impossible to teach everything important in any discipline. So in chemical engineering, I cannot teach a student everything that is important about chemical engineering in the time of it. So you can only teach a few important things. And then you have to leave it to the student to decide what else they would like to study and how they would like to prepare themselves uh, to essentially you know, map what is going to happen after they get out. And Really, the question of employability is 
where will the student end up after they leave? In most cases, even people taking up technical jobs, after a short time, they often move into very different functions. Right? And so this kind of breadth of education that was mentioned in the morning, I feel that is really quite important. And uh, that should play a major role in you know, deciding where a person will work and how they will perform and so forth. Well, 
受前面的启发呀，我主要想讲，呃，三层意思。第一个呢，就是，呃，我们，呃，我们通常说我们区分呢，呃，比如说第一级教育、第二级教育、第三级教育，或者说普通教育、职业教育、高等。其实我，我挺愿意这么来分，就是有普通教育，有专业教育，有职业教育，是由宽到窄这样一个。呃，发展由这个广谱的、普实性的，然后一直到最后的和职业的零距离的。那么就大学教育来说，我觉得可能他，嗯、我还是赞同的。首先，他不，他不是一个职业教育，这个这个这个是我说 university 这个来源，然后是应该是一个专业教育，同时要有更多的同时，尤其是现在这个科技飞速发展，就应该有个宽基础。我还是赞同，包括咱们上午副校长所讲的，扩大的这个改革。方向，这是我想讲的第一层意思。The professor was saying that he would like to classify the, the education into several types. The first type that he mentioned now is to、um, classify education from the broader to the more uh, extra, uh, specialized terms. So、uh, this includes ordinary, higher, or professional、um, types of education. 我想讲的第二层意思是政府干什么？因为我觉得呢，政府呢，呃，首先这思想在如果说我们转向市场经济下的这个公共服务政府呢，那么我觉得一个呢是，呃，这个立法手段的保障，因为这样是政府要做的事情。呃，第二个保障呢是通过财政啊导向，啊财政拨款这样一个通过资源配置的方向重点。引导导向进行专业调整。那、嗯、么第三个呢，就是这个，呃，这个通过规划，啊，这也是我们政府做做规规划，啊，所能所能做的。那么这个包括咱们新加坡的教育体系啊，美国加州的高等教育体系啊，我觉得都是，嗯，有明显的这个，呃，设计的痕迹，而且设计的比较比较好，啊，那么这个。第四第四个功能呢，呃，应该说也是最基础的功能，就是信息服务的功能，这是政府要提供的。各个高校做不到，各个高校都在山脚下。我们政府呢，它应该统观全局，是在山山底，山脚下只看见一条路，山山顶上能看见好多条路。所以呢，我觉得政府要有这发挥这四个作用。First is to、uh, provide some sense of security.、Uh, first of all, is the legis true, true legislation. Second one would be to give financial support, and the second thing that the government could do is to have a systematic implementation of policy. And third one will be,、um, since the government is at the apex of the society, it should provide information as well as relevant resources to the higher education. 然后我先讲的最后一层意思呢，就是政府还有一个作用呢，这个作用可能就是不得已的时候，别的办法都没办法的时候呢，可能行政手段还得使用。这个呃，我上午谈到了这个呃，中国现在进行的这个专业设置的改革，过去高校不具有这个专业设置自主权，现在呢，过去法律上规定咱没实现，现在呢就是实现了，但是实现的是就一般情况而言的，呃，实际上这个专业分为三类，一个是一般专业。呃，这个呢，还有一个是特色专业，这都不需要审批。还有一类呢是国家控制布点的专业。这个国家控制布点呢，并不是说它有别的意义，而是就是比如说，就是现在中国以前我们有位校长说过一句话，说哪个专业吃香，我们一直把它办到办臭为止。嗯，就是就是没有这个，这个，哎，所以呢，啊，就是政府这个时候呢，可能有一些行必要的行政措施，必要性。Another thing that the government could help with is,、um, is the government has、uh, kind of classified、um, uh, employment into three types, jobs into three types. One is the ordinary,、uh, ordinary cultivation. The other, the second one will be a more specialized、um, learning for the students, and the third one will be、um, teaching the students. Uh, professionals' uh, expertise or skills of national importance, and a lot of emphasis 
professor thinks should be placed on the national um, importance professions. My problem is, I think, it's not so stable. After four years, it's always stayed somewhere. Somewhere it's going to have to But in the economics of the profession, it requires, because this is what it has done. I'm an economist, so I really want to follow. I want to follow this, uh, this question. I think that here, of course, we talk about the employability. We have a question about the supply demand. Like we we supply, uh, I mean, relevant talent to according to the demand. Then uh, this morning, I would say, uh, well, several speakers mentioned the uh, uh, the the law of a university is to transform uh, society. So we, in that sense, we we need innovation. The university must be uh, innovative. Right? To, to play a transformative role. But here, I see a quite a, a contradiction. On the one hand, of course, we have to supply a useful, uh, whatever, skilled labor, talent to society. On the other hand, of course, we have to transform the society. That's the way. The second way, I think, is because the university is not a fully independent entity. The university is a part of society, even in some cases, like China, a part of polity. So this contradiction between uh, between university as 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 an innovative organization and as being a part of a society, a part of a, of a polity. Uh, this morning, uh, someone mentioned the academic freedom. So to what degree? A university, a university could be innovative. What kind of innovation is acceptable to society or to the polity? Because China, Singapore, or India have quite a different political systems and a different social, cultural background. So I want to ask our speaker, to what degree social factors or cultural factors promote or constrain at university as an uh, innovative entity. Oh, 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 I still want to ask Professor Lili to, to answer this quite first, because this morning she mentioned that. Mm, home ground advantage, <laughs> disadvantage. <laughs> um, well, I think that, um, I think that certainly universities have a role 
uh, in in well, you know, sort of sorry to use it use such econom economic economistic terms, but the universities have a role to produce the workforce for the country. But I think universities have a role that's larger than that. Universities, um, we've already spoken about the, the work of the faculty and the researchers in terms of what they contribute in terms of knowledge creation. Knowledge creation, again, can be for very economic ends. It can be very much about, you know, sort of the new product that can be uh, mass marketed, etc., that can, you know, drive a, a new sector of the economy, those sorts of things. But knowledge production also, I think, in terms of a social and cultural understanding of the society and community that we are a part of. Um, I speak as a social scientist that if my colleagues and I are working on issues like immigration and understanding uh, cross-cultural tensions or understanding how multicultural societies work or don't work, I think that sort of knowledge production is quite as important in enhancing our understanding of the society that we are part of and um, perhaps sometimes contributing to policy making uh, to make for a better society and community that we are a part of. The, I guess the tricky part is when research of such a nature is uh, it, it, uh, uh, comes up with, with difficult views that society has to come to grips with, uh, contrarian views that a society uh, or a polity or a government or a, 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 a official machinery has to come to grips with and is uncomfortable with, with the sorts of ideas, the sorts of views, the sorts of opinions, uh, hopefully, hopefully well-researched, grounded opinions, um, um, that sometimes can be that sort of discomfort. But I think that if universities are not producing that kind of knowledge, that pushes the boundary, that forces us to look at ourselves uh, critically, carefully, uh, with a view to the betterment of the society and community that, that we are a part of, then the university, I think, is not doing its job. That is really a concentration of uh, excellent faculty, excellent students. And one of the strong criteria is connection to the local environment. And I think this is something that's very important, that universities have to be connected in some way to the environment that they exist in. And Chagalwar uh, mentioned an example where you know, people in the university are addressing problems that are being faced by the nation, by the local area, and so forth. And this could be either research, it could even be consulting, or advice, or policy. So the university plays a very key role in uh, seeing how ideas that are generated within the university can actually diffuse out and be useful to society as a whole. And in some cases, it may change you know, the direction that the society is going in. That you know, there's a very new kind of invention or you know, new kind of idea, new way of thinking. It may change the society as a whole. And I think the, society, the university does have this role because it does give an environment where people are free to think in the way they want, They're free to come up with new ideas without constraints. And uh, I think that uh, you know, there are sort of an enclave where such things can incubate and and eventually benefit society. Uh, I would remember uh, very famous uh, professor Li Zhengdao, the Nobel Prize winner. Uh, he said, what is a bachelor degree student? That is a student to deal with a problem which uh, his teacher knows the answers to the problem. What's a, what is a, a math degree student? The student also deal with that problem. That's the problem his teacher don't know the answer. 
What is a PhD student? Yes. He also need to deal with the problem, but he needs to find the problem. So that means for today's higher education, we need to uh, give the students some kind of the ability to 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 evaluate the the, the, the tendency of the the, the society and uh, currently. The, the industry goes on, and to to give them some ability uh, to adopt, adapt, adapt to this change of the global uh, economy. Uh, in that way, I think that we can uh, switch our uh, university function, uh, transforming uh, technology innovation uh, method to our student. So I think the methodology uh, is quite important for, for higher education to students. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to here I wanted to add uh, one comment. Because here we have uh, on the one hand we have uh, global universal knowledge, science, science, engineering, technology, those universal. Then I'm myself a social scientist. And then we have a social, social scientist, social science, what deals with local society. We have local knowledge, right? So this is the how, uh, but this is, if we, because China, India, both are great civilizations. So I feel, for example, I don't know the case about India. For, for example, China, the, for the whole social science, uh, since the May 4th moon, you know, it's, when people talk about knowledge, that's Western knowledge. Knowledge from the West, import everything. Western is universal. So the, 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 the task, responsibility of the whole intellectual <coughs> circle is to learn from West, almost forget their own tradition. So that's the purpose of university. I wonder whether the purpose of university is to develop your own our civilization or, or whether you want to transform your own uh, civilization to something else. So. Uh, I think when rightly said, uh, I think the cultural values what are cherished by the society will also will have to be continued to be cherished. And in that sense, I think when you mentioned uh, whether the university should have a transformative role or not, my feeling is uh, the university can do both the things together. I think there is no serious contradiction between a university trying to make people employable both for today and tomorrow, but at the same time ingraining in them the right values of the culture which, uh, I mean the good heritage which each one of us had in our own time. So I think uh, the cultural values can still be uh, strengthened during uh, our education. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention about employability uh, being, you know, you try to meet the requirement of what the market needs. <coughs> Unfortunately, in a large country like India, and I'm being very frank, I think it's even difficult to know what the demand is, what the demand is likely to be. In fact, I'm painfully aware of the fact that suddenly we found that there was a shortage of civil engineers. Because uh, nobody had uh, sort of thought of as to how many civil engineers would be required. There was no uh, the manpower plan in a large country like ours, though I think it's done in some uh, small office somewhere. But I think actually there is always a gap between what is demand and what is projected. So I think uh, there would be always there is a need to keep uh, sort of you know changing your uh, strategy from time to time or changing your, you know, how you are uh, having admissions in various courses, etc. And uh, obviously, the need for revising syllabi and the curriculum, etc. will again be uh, dependent on what the industry needs. Now, you also mentioned about what kind of <coughs> innovations uh, a university, whether innovations are possible <coughs> and are engaged primarily for employability. I think innovations are uh, definitely possible 
in every uh, situation, like for example, I would uh, give in our own Indian situation. Now, we have a very serious problem of our teachers not uh, having the refresher courses or the 66 academic colleges which we have in the country have not delivered. At the same time, we cannot afford to have our teachers who themselves are obsolete in their knowledge. So the need for <coughs> refreshing them, giving them domain knowledge is of utmost importance. At the same time, we do not have the wherewithal to have so many, you know, invite foreign faculty or other competent people to do it. But we do have our IITs. So one of the innovations which was thought of, thought of in fact, by Mr. Kakar, uh, Kakar's IIT Mumbai was to train uh, a batch of, I mean, they have already trained about 20,000 teachers in domain knowledge as well as in other related area in the last six months. And they intend to cover in the next three years one and a half lakh, that is 150,000 teachers would be given this kind of a refresher training using ICT. They have created 500 resource centers in the country, spread throughout the country, and each one of them will be training a number of people during summer vacations and things like that. Now, this is definitely an innovation. Similarly, the you know, creation of virtual laboratories. Now, we have many engineering institutions in the country which are not endowed with that kind of infrastructure, but at the same time, we can really afford to have engineers coming out who have not uh, seen an NMR or who have not experimented on uh, some of these costly equipment. So this virtual laboratories is again perhaps a kind of innovation which IITs have come up with to give the necessary uh, facilities to even those who are less endowed today. Similarly, this concept of meta-university which I mentioned, where we are taking the strength of one university and also another, and then the students have a choice of selecting some courses, some credits from one university and some others from another university. Now, as I mentioned, Jamia Milia and Delhi University have already started a course uh, on masters in mathematics. Shortly, Delhi University and uh, JNU are also going to uh, then uh, are going to join this meta university concept. Then there would be need for many innovative courses, like I mentioned, shortage of civil engineers. I see in India in the coming future, if you are going to spend $1 trillion on infrastructural development, there is bound to be litigations as well. So we would need people who have VTAC as well as LNB, who are both having legal knowledge as well as the engineering knowledge. So I think some of these things I think some small innovations in course design and things like that will have to be continuously done by our uh, higher education system. Uh, and of course the frugal in innovations which I had mentioned in my morning discussion of Mr. Sam Kudra, that always can be done and they are more in the nature of value analysis than value engineering.我想的这个现在的大学的确和以往的这个形态都有很大的变化那这个大学已经进入一个大众化甚至普及化的阶段所以这在这样一个时代呢可能大学的确已经是走出向下谈论一下因为美国学者所说的大学怎么挣那几价
university has gone through a lot of changes and developments all these years. And recently, or rather, now the current trend is that the university has come out of this um, of a, of a um, ivory tower and is trying to serve the society. 我想说的第二层意思是大学和文化环境的确是一个互动的关系所以我们说大学为什么大学文化大学精神就在此。And the second point is that uh, there's a very, there's a link that um, link very close link between higher education and the cultural context of society. Uh, no doubt the cultural context is being shaped by higher education, and higher education leads the cultural uh, context. But at the same time. The cultural context can influence how higher education will develop. Uh,我想说的第三点意思呢,就是这个要从自己国家的实际出发,办好自己的教育。没有最好的,只有最适合的。我就常常我来过新,这是我第二次来新加坡,我的感觉呢,我觉得新加坡就是有自己的特色。这个好的东西，我就去学习啊，不怕别人说我模仿。呃，这个编写我还保留，也不怕别人说我标标新立异。呃，很有自己的特色，没有最好的，只有最适合。The third point that he brings out is that there's no such thing as the best kind of higher education. Uh, it's the the best education in his uh. Understanding would be one that suits the needs of society or the country the best. And there's no, uh, it's okay to, to learn from other countries. It uh, shouldn't be afraid that people will say that you're copying them. And then it's okay to innovate too.
Now we should, uh, it's high time that we should involve the audience in these discussions. Uh, why not, yeah, why not, why not to make it a more question and answer session? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Token Lam. I'm from NCU Office of International Affairs. Before I ask my question, perhaps let me give our overseas distributed guests a bit of background. Uh, Singapore government wants to increase our cohort participation rate to 40% by 2020. In other words, in Singapore, you know, Singapore produces about 40 to 45,000 babies every year. So in, by 2020, 40% of these 40, 45,000 babies will be able to enter local universities. This is the background. At the moment, we are about 26, 27%. My question is that um, with that 40%, maybe to uh, Mr. Niam, with that it being one of the catalysts for Singapore economic development, you know, many years ago, with that kind of percentage, can Singapore economy take in so many graduates? You were saying during your time, you talk about one engineer, five diploma holders, and ten IT graduates. Now we talk about forty percent graduates. We talk about um, competing globally, but how many of them will actually go overseas and compete against other people? Would like to have your, your thought on this, and of course, for our guests from overseas, perhaps it may also happen in your country, you know, like in China, every year, China about what 10 million graduates. All right, do you have enough job for these graduates? I'm not too sure about India, so I think this is a very important question. That especially now for Singapore, we are trying to um, um, tighten the so called foreign, uh, foreign workers, foreign labor. And that will add um, additional burden to the to the local economy because we expect to have very uh, to have a slower growth in our economy. So how can we um, have enough jobs for this forty percent graduates? And not forgetting, there will be at least another three five percent who actually went overseas to get a degree and come back. Now, how can we solve the problem? Thank you.
calculation thing, and we are looking at that now, and it's just as good to, 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 to raise the levels of our, of our students. But are you, are you, getting, are you getting them a shock or not? And that depends on whether Singapore remains a stable place, good infrastructure, and you can, you can attract the, the, the sophisticated industries. I would say that Singapore's experience, it has always been that supply chain is the only demand. If you have got a trained labor or prepared to work for certain reasons, you, you can get the, 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 the FDIs, the, the, the foreign companies. And if that is experience, so when I was chairman of GDP, I said, you train one engineer, I cannot give him a job. So I think uh, it has to be that way. It has to be that way. It cannot just be. What do, we, what do we wish it to be? No. What is it practical? And, and our adjustments can be not as laid a foundation. Our adjustments can be incremental. You don't have to say, I have now the target 6.5 million population. How do you do that? In terms of whether you can sustain the population or not, at what level of uh, do you have? And can you attract the industry? I think Singapore today can still attract good industry because we offer one one uh, price, one element that other countries cannot. If they have more labor, more talent, more ability, but they do not have the weakest country. And the, and the big countries that come to Singapore, whether the Rolls Royce, the Fifth Pharmaceuticals, <coughs> they come here because their investment require long gestation period. They want to be here for the next 25 years not just for the next five or ten years. So I think so, 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 so political stability for Singapore is really the key. Political stability and rising knowledge. We, we must not with our knowledge so that we can we can we can we can uh, meet the requirements of the new industry. We are a very good actually if you are a say a big multinational you know put up say a hundred million dollar new drug company You'll choose Singapore because hey, our infrastructure is so good. Our government is very high. You are probably that's why we have to keep it that way by the way. You cannot go around the bullying with this thing called government. So Singapore, I think we are price taker, we are small. Our problem is actually finite. Very finite. We only five by five million people. That's the early days in GDP, we, we used to pay for 30, 40,000 jobs. So we don't, have to, we don't have to settle for the second pair by <coughs> And that's why I, I show you my friend. I, I don't like the casino. Because casino, they're creating 30,000 jobs. Second level type of jobs. You are not, you're not, you're not creating the jobs for the Chinese and <coughs> engineers. So that's why I think Singapore, the, 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 the two casinos, I think the world are the wrong reading on Singapore. We are going in for easy money, to think to choose easy money. And, and, and we will not better because we are producing so many graduates. Huh? And, and we should be getting a good job team and not settle for this, uh, what I call song and dance. <laughs> and this is my first time I've so. <laughs> so, so, but that's the way I feel because we, our education, so that we can get the better pay, the better pay in terms of the foreign bonds. It will be investing, as I said, the old age it was infrastructure that depends. Investing so much in education. It must pay us dividends. And Singapore being a peaceful place, good government, we would be able to get, we may not, unlike China and India, you can get a nice but we will get certain, certain uh, some of the industries that are coming here are very good industries. But it requires high skill and reasonable wages. So what that is, uh, that, that is the way I look at it as a <coughs> former salesman.
所以我就我就有两两两点意思，第一个呢，我就觉得呢，哎、呃，肯定呢，一个社会一个教育结构呢，哎、呃，它是要它是要考虑的，呃，并不是完全自由化。那么这个呢，主要是因为这个，如果是比如说新加坡的，说是百分之四十是高了低了，这我没有研究，我不敢说。但是呢，呃，有一点肯定要这要考虑。要考虑，就是因为如果要是没有设计的话呢，第一可能造成教育浪费，这个不需要那么多，呃，经济社会发展需要多少，这是一个基础，所以这个这是一个。第二个呢，就是说，呃，这个会带来，如果是盲目的发展呢，呃，可能会带来一些不稳定的因素。那么这是我想说的这个一般意义上我对这个问题的理解。嗯、p r o f e s s o r says that education structures has to be thought about carefully. If and it shouldn't have absolute freedom. If not, it might cause some resources、uh, wastages. And the second thing will be that、uh, if the development is not contained or is not planned properly, it might lead to some sort of insecurity. 呃，我想说的第二层意思呢，就是就中国的情况来说呢，呃，我觉得也要引导人们的合理预期。呃，我的老主任呢，呃，曾经做过主持的一项独生子女的研究，呃，这个也包括一些对照组非独生子女，最后得出的结论大概呢是有一项，就是中国因为这个中国现在东方文化的背景呢，这这个。大概有将近三分之一的家长希望自己的孩子将来能读到博士。中国十三亿人，这是三分之一的三四亿人跑到大街上，三四亿的博士，那那肯定是个可怕的事情。尤其与经济社会发展需要也也也不匹配，所以呢，这里面当然就有一个呢，就是要靠这个，还是要有一些制度设计。那么这些年，中国为什么这几年大力发展职业教育，包括中职，包括高职？也就是这个道理。现在呢，我们的统计呢，你比如说高等学校方面呢，现在高职的已经高职学校数是超过了本科数，啊、呃，我们是有一千二百八十所，然后本科一千一百二十九所，呃，那么中职当然就是做一个呃中等教育的，那么它是更大的，因为总共中国的高等教育毛主席才百分之二十点九。And also,、uh, he thinks that the so the society should have reasonable expectation. For <coughs> instance, in China, there was a survey that says that、uh, the parents, one third of the parents, hope that their kids can become a PhD candidate, which is actually too much because it is、uh, it doesn't fit what the society needs. Transformational means extracting raw materials and converting them into finished goods. Transactional means interactions that can easily be scripted or automated. And passive means complex interactions requiring a high level of judgment. Now, there's an old school of、uh, 
of thinking to which I probably belong, that judgment comes from experience. Uh, but nowadays, we are not have no time for experience, right? So you become a CEO at age 40, otherwise you are a loser. Um, so um, so um, I, I suppose higher education will help, have, have to help students uh, develop judgment uh, through other means, right? Or maybe compact or experience or whatever. There's a lot of talking about uh, sort of experiential learning, uh, but we know that that's not real in real world. Um, so um, is there sort of other things that higher education can do uh, to uh, make up for the, the lack of time to develop uh, experience? that in some places, you know, you have so much innovation coming out, you, know, you have you know, so many leaders being produced from some places, and a lot of it is dependent on you know, how the peers interact with each other, and you know, what sort of environment, what leaders they're given to do these things. Uh, just to give you an example, you're talking about, uh, you know, young CEOs. Uh, so, you know, one of my alumni, he was very interested in business. This was in the, he was a 1969 graduate of IIT, so you know, very long back. He actually started a company inside IIT as a student. And his company was just supplying, you know, small snacks. Because at that time there was nothing inside IIT. So he started a company, but he had a board of directors, he had all this stuff. And he actually went through what a CEO or whatever should go through that small scale. Today is, of course, the wealthiest uh, Indian American in the US. Million dollars. So I think that you know you have to create the environment there so that people gain the right kind of experiences. You know, because it's impossible to get this kind of uh, confidence or you know, being able to make judgments and so forth unless you've done it at some stage. In the I want to uh, talk about uh, my point of view about uh, education philosophy. Uh, why it's quite important uh, right now for Chinese uh, university? Uh, because I think this uh, in, in China the traditional country uh, very impacted for the students and uh, even uh, your children. In kindergarten, and the teacher uh, say, "This is right. This is right." He, uh, your children don't care about uh, what's said about the parents. They just believe the, 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 the teacher. That's a, 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 a tra traditional cultural impact to uh, to our uh, children. And if we review uh, uh, for 30, 30 years uh, education reform. Maybe uh, Dr. Young is an expert, but uh, we just uh, we often uh, discuss about right now uh, in China. Uh, we need more education expert. Also, we need more student. The first uh, first uh, issue is, is easy to understand. The second issue. It's, hard, it's difficult to understand because right now, millions of students uh, in university right now in China. But uh, from another point of view, most of them are not students. It, they are uh, examiner from the primary school to university. They, they can do examination very well, but they cannot do things uh, with the cre creative ideas. So that is, that is the reason why Chinese university need to enhance such kind of the, the creative ability uh, from, so we need to learn from uh, wisdom. We, we need to uh, exchange ideas with uh, different countries uh, 
professions. We need to share this different category uh, how to improve our edu higher education. That's uh, the reason why we put this table. If I may, uh, just two comments. One is, um, when we talk about experiential learning, um, the way which we've interpreted it in, in, here, here at our own university, but also in many other universities I've seen, is to say, let's get the students out into other parts of the world. Let's get them out for a week, two weeks. Um, they see different things, right? And, and so I think I, I would describe that as learning by observing. And I think that's good. That's, but I think that what's really lacking in the really experiential learning is learning by doing. Um, we're not getting our students to do things sufficiently. So um, the example that you gave of actually setting up a company and, and, and falling in the process. Because like you, um, maybe it's a, it's a generational thing, but uh, there's nothing I think that can really replace experience of actually doing something, uh, succeeding and feeling the joy of it and figuring out why you succeeded, and failing and feeling the pain of it and figuring out why you failed. Um, so, so I draw that distinction between learning by observing and learning by doing. That's one comment. The second comment I have is a more general comment uh, about education and what we're doing as educators. I feel that very often we're introducing more and more new things more and more new ideas, etc. But we're not really taking stock, at, and, and this is the researcher in me, we're not really doing our careful research to say what actually was the outcome of that experiment in educational pedagogy or something. So for example, we, we think sending our students out on uh, an NUS overseas college is a good thing. We think that technology in the classroom is a good thing. But is it? And how has it been good? And how do we... And, um, how do we make it better? Have we done the actual research to say what are the educational outcomes of things that we've tried? Um, and I think that sort of educational research has been lacking. Uh, yeah, just, yeah. Uh, I think, Mr. Peter, uh, uh, the best thing, of course, is to have the experience of doing and learning. But I think in our, some of our educational institutions, the case study method, I think the, the case studies are discussed. Also, I think, uh, give us a distilled wisdom of uh, somebody else having gone through that experience and uh, given us how he or she managed that situation. So I think even that would be a fast tracking experience for such这个东西方教育学学是一个应该应该的方式其实反映的是一个共同的趋势也是提了一些意见education philosophy and Eastern education philosophy professor think that it's not a problem whether it will or it won't but it has already been so. Uh, for instance, in China, um, they are trying to reduce examinations to cut down on the stress on the students, whereas in the West, uh, they are having tests. Though they are doing different things, different policies, but actually they have, they want to attain the same goal. So for instance, in the West, the higher education is gaining more and more importance. Now, 
其实你看看这个刚刚里面有一句话，以教师为主导，以学生为主体，这句话其实不是新话，但是这个后面还有一句，反映我们的着重点就是更加注重发挥学生的主动精神，这应该说就是应该说也是学习国外的一些呃这样一个一个一个一个经验。From other aspects, though, we can see how China is learning from the West is that uh, China is trying to encourage the students to be more active in the pursuit of knowledge. Well, I can tell you my experience. I would say that in the 70s, we established a joint single set up of funds, single work. They like a lot of things. Like the facility, they, they brought in the trainer. So, so they are teaching our students how to machine by hand, manual machining of metal pieces to form components. So two years later, CAD CAD machine was introduced. CAD CAD, where you just you just set the computer the thing and then cut the cut the metal pieces. So I asked the Japanese manager, uh, "Can you?" We wasted our two years teaching the boys how to do machine learning. They don't know Mr. Yang. They are not in fact machining with hand, strive of perfection. You know what is excellent, what is perfection. That's why he said the spirit of perfection is not in He's still in him. So when you give him a machine, to make his job easier, he'll reach perfection sooner. So so it is a mental so he he opened my eyes. It's not just a manual, it's a mental exercise. That because he's got a mission in my head, you know, he, 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 he wants the idea, he wants the meaning of perfection. And that's why Japanese product is suddenly fail. You know? So this is, I think, this is, I think uh, experiential learning is not just, I think, if I may do respect to case study. Case study is just something tell you how to. Question of the panel. Uh, in order that a university, whether it's in the US or the United States, can play a very important role of supplying the kind of wages to provide a political leadership, 
what the business and the industry needs, and what the society as a whole needs, and what the community needs. We must, for well, this obvious reason, it's obvious that they will have to attract some of the green material students into the university. And uh, the university, especially NUS, is having a kind of problem in Singapore. We feel that there is, a, there is definitely quite a vast differential between private, private sector innovation and the career in the university, which of course it gives you a very high respect. Uh, not as much as before in China, where everything else is low class, especially business work, except scholarship. But I think that uh, today it is changing. It is money talks now. Now I know of quite a few friends, children, by the time they are in their mid 30s, they are already earning half a million, three quarters of a million, which which are, the university will not be able to provide. So are the university having problem attracting some of the so at least the you know good portion of the cream of the student population into this course. And secondly, do the university teaching staff have the kind of worthiness to know what the society needs for its graduates in order to play the time? Who wants to answer this question? <laughs> um, I, those are very good questions, thank you. Um, I hope I haven't misinterpreted, but um, so the first question is about whether or not the universities are able to attract, or certainly NUS, able to attract uh, high quality students as students into the university. And then are we able to encourage them to go on and become academics so that they because of the competing uh, attractions of the marketplace. Um, attracting good students into the university as students, um, it's, it's become, I think, much more competitive than it was in the past when we were a single university and then two universities, now three, four, soon to be six uh, universities. So the competition is real. Um, but I think that as we grow more universities, we don't want universities to all look alike and all be after the same kind of students. I don't think we want a me too sort of strategy, university after university after university. I think that there are, there are students with different kinds of talents, different kinds of predilections, and, the, and there must be different kinds of universities, different kinds of pathways for different types of students with different strengths. So more technologically oriented, more comprehensive, more you know, uh, applied or practical in that sense. And I think all the different universities must then be able to attract the, the students best suited for the character of that university. In a sense, it's like what our uh, colleague from China was saying, there's perhaps no such thing as the best, but the best suited in that sense. So that's one. Uh, are we able to then attract our best graduates, or some of our best graduates, to say, stay in academia and do something good for the next generation uh, through education, as opposed to going out to the marketplace and making tons of money. Um, I think that this has been an abiding issue for, for NUS for a long time, particularly during the years when Singapore's economy was thriving. Uh, it's very easy for a young graduate who's been studying, you know, um, however many years in their life, 16 years of their life, to say, well, I just want to get out of school and I want to start getting to work and I, I want to make my, my, my first dollar myself. Uh, and so um, in the late, sorry, in, in the early 80s, um, right up to the 1990s, NUS had a scheme, um, for those, some of you I think will know this, which we call the Senior Tutorship Scheme, which was quite a, 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 I would say, a generous scheme. What it did was to uh, try and pick from amongst the best graduates and say, you seem to have a penchant uh, 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 for, for academic work, would you consider joining the university? And we would sponsor your studies, uh, your PhD studies overseas, and at the same time also pay you a salary, after which you're obliged to return uh, and you know become an academic at NUS. A few of us in this room, I think, were on that scheme. 
uh, I, I certainly was one of the beneficiaries. For someone like myself, where it would have been impossible for my family to afford an overseas education for me, uh, it, it, it did the trick for me. I was interested in research. I was also worried about, you know, sort of having my family support me for so many years and you want to study some more. Um, if the university had not had a scheme like this, it would have been very difficult for me to do something like this. I use the past tense because that scheme has morphed and morphed to something quite, well, somewhat different now, so it's no longer as generous. Is it therefore able to attract some of the best students? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, the scheme that I described, which I was on, I think had its benefits in being able to attract quite a number of my colleagues, uh, some, uh, quite a lot of my uh, contemporaries into academia, but it also had a pitfall. The pitfall was that perhaps it was so generous uh, that people, well, this is a theory anyway, that people kind of felt it was an iron rice bowl. You've invested so much in me, you're not going to fail me as an academic, right? So, so you've, you've paid for my education, you've paid my salary overseas, etc. And when I return, I'm not as competitive with other academics internationally. That's okay, I'll still have my job. You know, so, so the theory is that some, some went a bit soft. Um, and so the scheme was, was revised. But I, I fundamentally think that it is, it, is, uh, um, it is a necessary scheme, particularly for economies which are thriving, where the lure of the marketplace is strong. Um, of course, nothing beats picking the people right, uh, picking the people well, because you don't want people joining academia just for the money. Thank you, Yang Tung from the East Asia Institute. Uh, much of the discussion has focused on the linkage between universities and employability, as well as universities and innovation. So I just want to ask a slightly different question. Uh, in terms of the role that universities can play uh, in particular on character building. Because if you think of it, uh, many of these students, if they do well in society, uh, they are more likely to want to give back to society. So when I talk about uh, character building in particular, one of the key attributes would be uh, values of compassion and caring uh, for those who are less who don't do as well as them. So I just want to ask this question. Uh, to what extent are universities important in uh, building uh, good character? Thank you. Good evening. I'm most happy to respond to that, because um, I have some views about this. Um, some years ago, when I was um, in the provost's office in charge of education, I remember starting a discussion campus-wide um, on introducing service learning on campus. Um, the reason I did that was because I felt that um, um, much as we were doing many good things in terms of developing the technical knowledge of students, the academic knowledge of students, perhaps we weren't paying enough attention to this dimension of learning and growth as individuals. What is service learning? Um, it's really about getting students out into the community uh, getting involved in various kinds of community service, uh, but not just, uh, you know, two weeks stint here and uh, three weeks stint there, and then coming back and feeling good about oneself and kind of pat patting yourself on the back to say, yes, I have gone to an elderly care home and I've done my two weeks with them or something like that. Um, what I was also interested in was to get um, students to be well prepared uh, thinking about the issues, thinking about what assistance means, thinking about what, um, comp what, what, what social service means, what welfare means, what, um, you know, so what are, what are the causes of, uh, say, poverty if you're working with people in, in, uh, in need, for example? Uh, what does mental illness mean? How, does, how is that pathologized? Etc. So thinking about it, studying about it beforehand, 
going out and doing something about it, and then coming back and reflecting on it. Um, so, so I was quite keen to, um, you know, introduce this, etc. There were efforts at it, and some of that I think still remains. Um, but suffice to say that it was difficult to do it on a large scale. Uh, it, it, it is true to say that some thought this is getting in the way of, of real education, you know, um, I need to get my course accredited. Why are you asking me to take a, a, a four credits out of this to go and do this kind of thing? And it is true that at the student level, some would say, if you don't give me any credits, why am I doing this, etc. So it, it did run up against very practical issues um, uh, that, that, that have been units. Um, Peter's unit, University Scholars Program, embraced it. It still does it. Um, but, but it needs local leadership in that sense, I think, and a commitment to it. Do I think that universities have a role in this more generally? Um, I think as educators, yes, generally. Uh, should it be done in a formal, in the curriculum sort of way? Should it be done outside the classroom? Uh, I think it's probably at this stage um, more difficult to do in the classroom as such. Uh, in the nature of uh, character development, it's probably also better done outside the classroom. Uh, but therefore, it also means a certain degree of informality, a certain degree of uh, 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 more volunteer leadership in these areas. Um, my final comment is that those, you know, students at university going age are in a sense still in their formative years, but not as formative as in their teenage years, where perhaps the greatest influence and the greatest possibility of change, uh, it, you know, is, is likely. Um, so by university, still possible, but probably a little bit more difficult by then. So um, for what it's worth, those are my comments. Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, this character building, uh, I think in India, in our Indian traditions, we used to have a system with, which was called Guru Kulam. That is, the students used to go and stay with the teacher in his house and learn. And there, even the kings used to send their children to the same uh, teacher. And they also used to stay in the same campus observing all those things which were common to everyone. And I think that kind of system gave them the value system. But today, instead of Gurukulam, we have Shishikulam. Why I'm saying that your internet reaches your house, and most of the teaching takes place through that. In fact, most of the teachers do not know the names of their students even. So the class is so large, so that personal touch, which used to exist between the teacher and the student, is totally missing. And of course, in our uh, anxiety to push in more domain knowledge, we've also removed those lessons on ethical values and uh, value system from our Philippi curriculum. I think so gradually, in this materialistic world, I think we have given a go-by to these ethical values, etc. Why I'm submitting this, I think, uh, I hope I'm not wrong, most of the scams in the financial system, etc., the, the brains behind them have been very highly educated management graduates. <laughs> now, how does this happen? In fact, it's even a pity, I think even, um, I remember, if I remember correctly, the, behind the terrorists who attacked the Twin Towers, there were some engineers. So I think uh, we are somehow in our this materialistic world, we have lost track of this character building, which is an essential part of education. So I think you are very right that we have to uh, come back and uh, get that uh, thing back into our system. Um, sorry, yeah. I might just add a small footnote. I just remembered something else that um, when I used to chair the University Committee on Educational Policy, which meant that we looked at every single a uh, new program or rev revision to existing program that exists in the university. Um, 
a couple of my colleagues on that committee were wonderful individuals who always asked the hard questions about where is the ethics in your, in, in your curriculum. If you're doing engineering, where is the environmental ethics in it? If you're doing business, where is the business ethics in it? Obviously, teaching in the classroom is one thing when we were talking about learning by observing, learning by cases, or learning by doing. Um, so, so it's only one dimension of learning, but there was, you know, if you've got the right people as the right gatekeepers, it can go a long way. And in, at that particular juncture, I remember these two colleagues in particular whom I so appreciated on that committee because they always ask those questions. She speaks from China. What, what university, what professor, what rules you play? Yeah. Uh, uh, for Korea, uh, curricular uh, development is very important for every uh, staff in the university. And, and, and uh, uh, currently, in, I think in China, we, uh, for the management level, we uh, face some uh, more challenges than in Singapore or in India because we cannot uh, uh, resign the, 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 the factory. Very difficult. But we. Oh, really? Yeah. But, but we would like to provide and help suggest our staff to go their several ways. Not all of them to go to the professors and that way. We have the, the, uh, some the research fellow, we have the, another uh, uh, type, uh, position for, for kind of the, the, the staff. Uh, uh, anyway, we, we need to, to uh, uh, design and the, find the opportunity to, to our staff. And we also uh, need uh, the staff uh, self uh, design their their self. Yeah, exactly. And we, we combine the, uh, with that such kind of uh, ideas uh, because in in, in, in China you, each university we have the, the union. I don't know either Singapore we have the union. The union. union? So, so sometimes the union is quite important uh, a function uh, in a management level to, to deal with such kind of thing. Education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为education和这个training的区别，因为
。那第二个就是这怎么来做这件事情呢？我倒觉得呢，可能咱们各个国家都有很多好的经验，呃。也这个归结到，我觉得有两个呢，就是一个从学校能做的呢，呃，一个就是利用这个 curriculum 啊，这个显性的和隐性的力量，呃，包括隐性课程。就我我想起来，我这个你比如说，在我我到过的这个咱们这个李光耀政策学院，呃，咱们国大的，我看我当时我看那那个那个里面墙壁上就有很多的那个名言。它本身也是教育的力量。我看那些所有的是教育的人，都是跟教育有关系。这就是个隐性课程，让每一堵墙壁都能够说话。嗯，然后再一个当然就是教师的力量。这个教师身先垂范、啊，这个这个学高为师，身正为范，所以这个教师这种影响呢是。The values. Uh, there are two ways that he cites. One is through a subtle way. Uh, he gives the example of he wants to speak on his school policy, and then he sees that uh many mortals hang on the walls. So to him, every wall speaks. In a sense, when people go there, they get kind of like get uh influenced by the things uh that are hung on the wall. And the second thing will be through a practical way. That is through the educators themselves. <laughs> Do you have some I was just uh, helping with the translation. <laughs> and thanks for the great sharing. Um, Vivian from Philanthropy Works, I actually want to follow up on the um, increase in the university places for our cohort size by 2020. So, um, has there been research done to see what the impact of such a relatively rapid increase, this is a 50% increase in university uh, places, what kind of impact would that have? Um, you know, you raised questions on whether the economy would produce jobs that would be meaningful and challenging um, for university graduates of, I guess, 2024. Um, I mean, you know, on one hand, we already have a shift to uh, Gen Y and, you know, a greater search for meaning even uh, in roles, right, uh, in, in jobs upon graduation. So that is already a shift that the marketplace or the workplace is grappling with. So if we have a larger number of um, university graduates coming onto the market with Presumably similar expectations at the same at the very moment um, that are not met. Doesn't that harm social stability then? And doesn't that, um, you know, and, and this has already been brought up, his preconceived as, as well. Um, it devalues the value of a university uh, degree, which means that we would be forced into an arms race to go on to master's degrees. And this is already happening, right? So. Um, I grew up here in Singapore. I went um, to the US for my undergrad and grad studies. Um, and amongst my friends, you know, there were quite a number that said that, uh, you know, a basic degree, even from the Ivy League or Oxbridge, is insufficient. You need the MBA. Uh, and of course, the, you know, quite a number of schools are quite happy to do that because it increases their revenue and, you know, um, has other, uh, you know, benefits as well. But does it really benefit the economy? Do the, does the increased investment in terms of time and resources actually bring about real value um, in, the, in the work done by such graduates? So, you know, is the ROI impact positive and reasonably positive? Or are we uh, venturing into the realm of diminishing returns? So, coming back to um, if I may also to, you know, a related point actually is what... Um, what is your question? Um, well, so is that move, you know, a, a well-considered one? And what is the evidence for and against that? Um, and, you know, related to that, university differentiation within Singapore, uh, that sounds wise, but 
is that really going to play out you know, in practice? Because if we look at what SMU strategy has been, it has essentially cherry-picked the, um, the most lucrative uh, career paths, uh, you know, BSA and US graduates, right? So I think it's pretty clear that you know, it's the business grads, and within that, the finance graduates, and clearly law graduates as well. If you look at the structure of Singapore's economy, if you look at the proportion of jobs, highest paid no, jobs. No, I think you need, you need to focus on your question and okay. get the panel to answer. Sorry, so um, essentially, is it is it the right move? And you know, on what key decision factors we can If I may, I think this is, uh, in a sense, a, a repeat of the question that was asked earlier. And it's a question that I, I ask myself. So if you're looking for answers from this panel, I think um, you're not going to get them because we're not the policy makers. Uh, you've heard Mr. Niam's views, and uh, if I read his, if I heard his views correctly, he was questioning uh, the, the, the policy direction, as I am as well. I've raised these same questions. Um, and one, just one additional question, um, which you haven't actually raised, but which I think is in, implicit in some of this, why is the government making this move and making this move so rapidly? And the question that I have asked is, is the government responding to public pressure uh, for enthusiasm for degrees? And the question that I have asked as a consequence of that is, are we therefore transferring the political pressure now to later? So please join me to thank our wonderful speaker. Uh, thank you, speakers. We are very grateful for you to spending your time here with us today, sharing your experience and your opinion on the theme of higher education. Uh, we are also very thankful for our foreign speakers who have made their way to Singapore for today's event. As a gesture of appreciation, I would now like to call upon Professor Julie Kong to present gifts to our foreign speakers. Professor Lili Kong, please. <coughs> Let us put our hands together for Professor Kong Ying Hong. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Kong. Professor Devan Kaka, please. Thank you, Professor. And now, Dr. Yang Ying Hu, please. Finally, Mr. R.P. Agarwal, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Agarwal. Thank you all for being here at this third China India Singapore Dialogue on Higher Education. No, that's all. <laughs> we would like to thank the organizing units in NUS, the Office of the Vice President, University and Global Relations, East Asian Institute, Institute of South Asian Studies, and the Office of the Deputy President of Research and Technology, as well as our co-organizers, the Planning and Commission of India, and the National Center for Education and Development Research of China. Finally, to you, our audience, we are grateful for your presence here today, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you.